Uh, tonight we are launching the first event of our new series, Women, Peace, and Security at IPI. This event series will focus on the important role of women in peace and justice processes and the relationship between conflict, peace, and gender. It will put a spotlight on the unresolved challenges in, the, in this area. Now we see this series as being very much a collaborative effort to support the great work already being done in the United Nations community. And we are very pleased tonight that we are launching the series by co-hosting with UN Women and the United Nations Development Program, the principles for uh, the special court for Sierra Leone. Uh, we have the president of the court, Justice Shireen Avis Fisher, the prosecutor, Brenda J. Hollis, the principal defender, Clara Carlton Hansels, and the registrar, Binta Mansare. We're also honored to have the special representative of the UN Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Zainem Hawa Bangora of Sierra Leone, as a discussant on the panel. So welcome, welcome to all of you. Really, it is a privilege to be on this panel with such an accomplished group, the principals of the court and the special representative of the Secretary General, who are making such significant contributions to empowering women and girls in peace and justice. Now I'd like to introduce our co-hosts and ask them to make opening remarks. So from UN Women, if I can ask uh, Dan Seymour, the Deputy Director of the Program Division of UN Women, to come to the lectern and to welcome as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, delegates, uh, colleagues on the, on the panel. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here uh, welcoming you to, to an event which UN Women is, is, is very, very pleased and proud to be supporting with our partners in, in UNDP and, and IPI. Uh, my, my boss, uh, John Hendra, uh, was going to be here, our Assistant Secretary General and uh, Deputy Executive Director for Programs, but the Executive Director called him into something that was unfortunately uh, both urgent and unavoidable, so he, he, he sends his uh, good wishes for the event, but unfortunately can't join us. Um, the reason, uh, I think, why, why so many people are here and we, we have people having to stand at the back, there's such a great turnout, uh, is that this is, such a, this is clearly an event we all share uh, a commitment to and, and, and recognize the importance of, uh, and all very much together in our support for this visit of the leadership of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Earlier this year, uh, our Executive Director and Undersecretary General, uh, Ms. Bachelet, briefed the Security Council uh, on women, peace, and security. And in that briefing, she noted that the reestablishment of the rule of law post-conflict is crucial to women's enjoyment of their rights and their ability to participate fully in post-conflict recovery and peace building. Functioning justice systems that enforce laws really are the, the first line of defense against the ongoing violence, the insecurity, the varied violations of their rights that too many women continue to experience after conflict. Now, international courts that have been created or supported by the UN have really played a crucial role in delivering this, and, and that's very much been the case with the, with the court in, in Sierra Leone. Increasingly, the prosecutions coming from these courts have included charges of sexual and gender-based crimes, these having been violations that for far too long went simply unpunished and perpetuated the impunity that facilitates them. And Ms. Bachelet called for uh, ongoing support, in particular for the three international courts that are currently winding down their work. We want to emphasize, as you and women, our own commitment to fulfilling this call and to making visible our support, not only through events and visits such as this, but more broadly, for the ongoing mandate of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. The court's jurisprudence on gender issues has been groundbreaking. It's laid the foundation in international criminal law for the recognition of forced marriage, sexual violence as terrorism, sexual slavery, recruitment and use of child soldiers, a crime that victimized an estimated 10,000 girls and boys during the conflict. And under the leadership of the new registrar, the court has been particularly successful in delivering outreach tailored to making the court accessible to children, young people, and women. And it's engaged uh, with women's organizations to undertake initiatives with rural women in particular. So this commitment to ensuring that justice is seen to be done has really been one of its great strengths uh, and contributions. And it's for all these reasons that the court has become a strong symbol of evolving international justice in relation to women's rights. And it's also a powerful symbol, I should add, importantly, 
of women's leadership in this area. It's really great. I mean, it, the, to have four uh, principles of the court all being women. I mean, it's, it's historic. Uh, it's part of a, of a broader trend we've seen in terms of women's leadership, and it's really something I see people wanting to applaud. And, and if you wanted to, that would be great. Uh, but the court, thank you. I'll, I'll get it started. Okay. <laughs> So these are all good things, but I think we're also all very aware the court has to continue to receive the support it needs in this drawdown phase if the achievements are going to be concretized, solidified, and made durable as a legacy. And this includes not just money, but broadly the time and, and all the resources that it needs to fully complete its mandate, including ongoing protection to witnesses and the finalization of cases, um, but also time and resources to document these important and, and extraordinary lessons that have been learned and, and the jurisprudence developed in the area of delivering on justice for women. They have to be documented and shared, not just within Sierra Leone for continued national ownership, but also with other courts that operate in other contexts. So let me say again, as UN Women and with our, with our partners, UNDP, IPI, we're so pleased to be sponsoring this, this visit of the leadership of the special court. We want to really congratulate all of you for what you've done, your achievements in strengthening women's access to justice and for providing a real model of women's leadership in international justice. So thank you, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, we're very pleased also to co-host tonight with the United Nations Development Program, and we're, we're very pleased to have Sheila Stewart, the Director of Governance and the Rule of Law at UNDP's uh, Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery, as well to make some opening and welcoming remarks. So Sheila, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real honor to be here. And um, as a young lawyer, when one is called to the bar, one of one's kind of great ambitions is to stand before inspiring officials of the court. And I think tonight you can say that um, one of the big items on my bucket list has been crossed off. Um, I'd also like to recognize um, Her Excellency Ms. Zainab Hawa Bangura, the Special Representative for the, Sec the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict. Um, thank the officers of the Special Court for being here and for taking time out to be with us, and thank IPI for hosting. Uh, the Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, Michelle Bachelet, often makes two remarks about SCR 1325. The first is that one of the most significant elements of 1325 is that it recognizes that war has a different impact on women than on men, not least because they're often targets in war. Women are targeted in rape, for rape, targeted for forced marriage, and targeted because they rep of what they represent in society, honor, and the ability of men and the state to keep them safe. This understanding about section about 1325 makes the jurisprudential achievements of the Sierra Leonean Special Court, Special Court very important. The court has recognized and set precedents which institutionalize our understanding of 1365. Examples include the first ever convictions in an international tribunal for crimes against humanity of sexual slavery and forced marriage, um, and precedents on sexual slavery where the trial chamber confirmed the elements of the crime and the contents of those elements, thereby developing gender jurisprudence and helping to build a unified legal understanding. Also the precedents on forced marriage where the judgment details this as a form of inhumane treatment and looks at the way that the whole notion of marriage has been abused when forced marriages happens. All of this is well captured by the trial chamber's observation that, that the deliberate and concerted campaign to rape women constitutes an extension of the battlefield to women's bodies. And as put by one commentator, by looking at individual acts that have taken place in war and how these fit into a larger pattern of events, the prosecutor and trial chamber have more deeply explained the actual role and consequence of gender-based violence in war. This resonates with the language of Security Council Resolution 1325, which calls on states not only to specifically ensure responsibility for war crimes related to sexual violence, but to look at the differential impact of such acts of war on women and girls. Michelle Bachelet's second comment on, is that 1325 highlights not only how important it is to support women as they fight sexual and gender-based violence, but also to ensure that women are part of the decision-making processes and at the front and center of them. In this regard, 
Having these inspirational women working together sets a great example for the way in which we want to work to deliver 1325. We are delighted as UNDP to have been able to help with this visit and will work to take forward 1325, the work of the Special Court and all the other advocates working on the ground. Thank you very much. Well, no, thank you very much, Dan and Sheila, and for uh, co-hosting us, uh, co-hosting with uh, us tonight this event. And um, as you both have outlined some of the accomplishments of the court, I want to chime in as well with just a, a few words of welcome, uh, particularly because we have this distinguished group here who have done so much and who are really going to address the topic of empowering, empowering women in post-conflict justice. Um, so just to... Uh, say a few words. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. The Special Court has made res such remarkable contributions to gender justice, international criminal justice, strengthening the stability in West Africa, and bringing an end to impunity in completing the trial proceedings against uh, former Liberian President uh, Charles Taylor for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And having this opportunity to hear from all of you on the work of the Special Court and putting it in the context of uh, the United Nations Security Council Resol Resolution 1325 is a unique, a unique opportunity. Um, so each of the, um, our plan for tonight is that each of the, the principals of the Special Court for Sierra Leone will make remarks and the Special Representative of the Secretary General, uh, Bangora, will add her personal perspective and help us put the issue into a broader context. Uh, we have asked each of our panelists to speak about five minutes. We would like to hear from all of them and then, of course, to have a chance for all of you to participate uh, in the discussion. So it's an honor to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Justice Shireen Avis Fisher, the president of the Special Court. Justice, Justice Fisher was elected as the president of the Special Court on June 1st, 2012. Uh, to highlight some of her experience, the experience, the skills that she brings to the special court, Justice Fisher previously served as the commissioner on the Kosovo Independent Judicial and Prosecutorial Commission and as an international judge on, on the war, of the War Crimes Chamber, Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So you have the, her bio, you have actually all the bios in your handout. With that, I say welcome, uh, Justice Fisher, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We very much appreciate this opportunity. I'm amazed that there are so many people here. That's delightful. We didn't know we had a following. I suppose it must have something to do with our Twitter account. <laughs> and we particularly thank uh, UN Women and UNDP, as well as Women's in Initiative for Gender Justice, which were the three organizations that made it possible for us to come to New York and address the Security Council yesterday. In my remarks to the Security Council, I delivered some good news. And let me share it with you if you haven't heard it yet. There was a survey that was commissioned by or paid for by the uh, EU uh, in which 3,000 people from Sierra Leone and Liberia were surveyed. These were people whose voices were not always heard, which of course always includes women, uh, as well as disabled people. Uh, and they were asked the question as to whether or not they believed that the Special Court for Sierra Leone had delivered on its mandate. And 80% of those surveyed said that it, they believed that it had. And even more impressive and humbling from our perspective is the fact that 91% of the people surveyed from Sierra Leone indicated that they believed that the special court had contributed to peace in Sierra Leone. And that was the highest accolade we could possibly get. Uh, and we just wanted to share that because I think many of us feel that we are, when we are working in this area uh, that our work may in fact go unnoticed by those who matter most, which are the people who are uh, in the countries where the conflict occurred. Uh, but in this one case, thanks to the efforts of 
some of the women that you will be hearing from very shortly, uh, their, our outreach program and the message of the court has in fact been delivered and the verdict has come back in a very positive way. Now, the accomplishments that you've been listening to, um, we're very proud of. We've also made our share of mistakes, which means that we are a guiding light for future courts under complementarity who wish to try these cases in the country where the conflict occurred and where the governments like Sierra Leone were willing to have justice uh, come to them and, and also be part of justice and administer justice, but where because of the war-torn nature of the country, they needed additional international help. That's the essence of complementarity. And Sierra Leone grabbed that concept before the ICC stat Rome statute. Uh, and I think that, that the government of Sierra Leone is to be complimented on its innovation of coming forward and requesting a hybrid court in the country where the uh, violence occurred. And we are not only representatives of the progress of 1325 in terms of women in positions of policy, uh, but we are also representatives of the hybrid nature of our court. We are two internationals and we are two Sierra Leoneans who are working together for the course of justice in Sierra Leone. Our success is due in broadly and most importantly to the fact that our staff and our principals are Sierra Leonean because they know their country, they know what their country needed and what they uh, could deliver and how to deliver it. And they were able to innovate in ways that internationals could never have been able to do. The internationals came in with financial support and some expertise and together worked with the Sierra Leoneans uh, in a very synergistic uh, and as it turns out from based on the survey, successful way. So we, uh, we are a living example of complementarity and we commend it to those of you in a position to consider it. And we also invite you to uh, rely on us and come to us in terms of lessons learned. Because as I say, we made our share of mistakes, no sense in repeating those. Uh, and we've certainly had our shares of successes, which we would like to share with uh, other nations as well. In terms of the progress that we've made uh, in terms of gender sensitivity, uh, it is not a coincidence that the special court is gender sensitive because those from the country of Sierra Leone as well as the United Nations who uh, joined together to make the agreement that, uh, that established the court were well aware of the atrocities that had been committed against women and girls. Uh, there were several reports done by several uh, rapporteurs for, uh, and the human rights commissions to the United Nations focusing specifically on those atrocities. And the government of Sierra Leone was aware of the fact that after the Lome peace agreement, not only did the atrocities not stop against women, but they actually increased. And so it is no coincidence that our statute is in itself gender sensitive and requires that personnel in the judiciary and the prosecutor and the registry have uh, expertise in gender issues and also in juvenile justice. <clears throat> if I could just give you five, I only have five minutes, so I'll just give you five ways in which my little piece, and, and if, if this is, I think, extremely important, the judiciary has one little piece of this entire process. We're part of a continuum. Our success depends on what happens before people get to the court and after they get to the court. But my little piece uh, being the judicial piece uh, in terms of uh, uh, contributing to women's access to justice in Sierra Leone, uh, there are five things to keep in mind, and this is what I think the special court attempted to do uh, in the courtroom. Uh, one was to encourage women to come forward. 
Uh, the second was to listen to women once they did come into the courtroom, to listen to their whole story, not to listen to uh, attorneys asking yes or no questions, but to hear the stories. The third was to recount what they heard in the findings of the court so that we have an historical record in our findings of what happened to women and what their stories were. The fourth was to reflect those stories and those findings in, a, in naming the crime accurately that was committed against the, the women, not to try to shoehorn it into existing crimes, but to recognize that crimes against humanity were grave crimes that could be perpetrated in ways that we had never imagined before. But that didn't make them less crimes. And the crime of forced marriage, for example, is an example of, of uh, a, a very brave judge on our trial panel, Justice Doherty, Teresa Doherty, who recognized and named that as a separate crime that was as serious, as grave, and as debilitating as other crimes that were listed by name. And finally, and most importantly, keeping faith with those women who did have the courage to come forward. We will go out of business in approximately 12 months. We still have to deliver the final judgment in the Taylor case in which we will determine whether or not Mr. Taylor is guilty or innocent. It is now in the appeal phase. It is not over. After that, the residual special court will be created. The residual special court will be a very small uh, staff of maybe six to eight people with judges in reserve who will only come forward when called upon for a case. Its job, among other things, but in my opinion, its most important job is to protect the witnesses who came forward, to make sure they are a focal point in case they are being interfered with, and to prosecute those people who might wish to interfere with them for contempt of court. Right now, we have seven individuals who have been charged with attempting to interfere with witnesses. One has been convicted and sentenced, and his appeal process is finished. He's gotten two years in jail. Four have been found guilty and are awaiting sentence. One is in the process of being of his trial, and the, the seventh one has was just arrested last weekend. So we're taking a very firm stand on this, but the important thing is that after the court uh, turns itself over to the residual court, we do not want other people to become emboldened uh, about the abil their ability to interfere with witnesses. And the success of the court ultimately will be negated if a single witness is harmed in any way. And so our appeal at this point uh, is twofold. One is uh, because we still have 12 months to go and people think we're finished because the Taylor case is finished. We still need money. We need $13,700,000 to complete our mandate. After that, we will need one to two million dollars a year in order for the residual court to, to continue. Uh, and it will continue as long as we have a, a living witness and a living perpetrator. So it's a long haul commitment. And, and justice is a long haul commitment. It cannot, it does not stop when the final verdict and appeal is delivered. And my plea to those of you who are in any kind of a position to do anything about it or to talk to people who can do anything about it is do not forget the special court because the, uh, the, your commitment uh, is much more important at this point than the 10 years that we've already put into it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Justice Fisher. A pros prosecutor, Brenda J. Hollis, is our second speaker. Prosecutor Hollis uh, served as the principal trial attorney in the office of the prosecutor, where she was responsible for leading the legal team prosecuting former Liberian President uh, Charles Taylor before being appointed by the Secretary General as the prosecutor for the special court. She is a very accomplished uh, legal expert on international law and criminal procedure and served as lead counsel in a number of historic uh, prosecution. The floor is yours, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank uh, UN Women, the Women's Initiative for Gender Justice. Uh, the UN Department uh, 
Development Program and this evening's host, the, in the International Peace Institute, for your efforts in the cause of achieving gender justice and also ending impunity. I think we all know that in general terms, empowering women in post-conflict justice requires action on many fronts, from instilling in children that girls as well as boys have an inherent right to develop their potential, to be treated with respect and dignity and afforded control over their life choices, to ensuring that girls and women have equal opportunity to education, to economic, social, and political opportunities based on their aptitude and their abilities, and ensuring that legislators appreciate the need for the inclusion of the 100% of their population in the laws and processes of their land, and that laws reflect gender equality, and that criminal laws recognize as serious crimes acts of sexual violence, whether committed in war or peacetime. In specific terms, empowering women in post-conflict justice requires that women, if you will, must be more than waitresses at the banquet of life. Uh, in fact, women must have a respected and guaranteed place at the table and must be able to partake fully of all the courses served. We all know that women and girls have been disproportionately victimized by conflict. And we also know that women have always been involved in efforts to end conflict, often in very impactful ways. The extraordinary courage, commitment, and work of women such as Zainab Bangura here today with us emphasizes the critical role that women play to end conflict and ensure lasting peace. However, all too often, they have been restricted to waitresses at the table of peace negotiations and the creation of peace and justice enforcement mechanisms. But the Special Court for Sierra Leone and other international courts have been a vehicle for empowering women in a judicial peace and justice mechanism. And I would like to focus a few remarks on some of the provisions of Resolution 1325 that have been given effect by the statute, jurisprudence, and work of the Special Court. Resolution 1325 reaffirmed the need to fully implement humanitarian and human rights law that protects the rights of women and girls during and after conflicts. The resolution emphasizes the responsibility of states to end impunity and prosecute genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, including those relating to sexual and other violence against women and girls. And the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the other ad hoc courts give full effect to these provisions of this resolution. As has been mentioned, the statute of the Special Court gives effect to these provisions by both incorporating gender crimes as crimes against humanity and war crimes, and by requiring that the Special Court have staff experienced in gender-related crimes and with expertise in sexual violence-related trauma. The jurisprudence of the Special Court and the other ad hoc courts has empowered women by acknowledging that sexual violence is criminal conduct of the gravest nature and deserving of severe punishment. The work of the Special Court gives effect to the provision in Resolution 1325 which reaffirms the important role that women play in preventing and resolving conflict in peace building, and it stresses the importance of women's equal participation and full involvement in all efforts to maintain peace and security, and the need to increase their role as decision makers in conflict prevention and resolution. The work of the special court, that is to say trials, empowers female victims of sexual violence through their participation in the trial process as witnesses. And by treating them as individuals deserving of respect and dignity and recognizing their courage and commitment to justice. 
It has further empowered them by allowing them at times to confront in a secure and safe environment, a courtroom environment, the persons who have actually committed sexual violence against them. This has often been a very positive experience and has a positive effect on these victims as they tell us when we talk with them after they have finished their testimony. The judgments in the cases in the special court have further empowered the victims by validating their experiences and clearly designated the, designating the crimes against them as serious violations of international norms of conduct. Now in return, it is the responsibility of the special court and will be the responsibility of the residual court to ensure the protection of these witnesses' security and to provide other support as they need it. This is a part of the mandate of the residual court in Article 18, and it is a responsibility of the court. And that responsibility must be carried out in ways that these victims, these witnesses, are comfortable with, that they have confidence in, or else we will have done a disservice to these people who come forward often at the risk of their well-being to serve justice by being witnesses in these courts. The special court has, often, has also given effect to this provision by including women in all facets of the court's work. Women have played a central role in achieving the mandate of the court. We see that two members of the appeals chamber are women and both have, or as with President Fisher, are now exercising the role of president of the special court. Of the three judges in one of the trial chambers, two were women. As you see, the current registrar is a woman, the principal defender is a woman. So in conclusion, I would simply like to suggest to you that the statute, the jurisprudence, and the work of the special court have given real life and effect to important provisions of Resolution 1325. And I am very privileged to have been able to be a part of that effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prosecutor Hollis. Uh, we'll now hear from Principal Def Def Defender Claire Carlton Hansels, a Sierra Leonean lawyer and Principal Defender since November 2009. She is the first Sierra Leonean to occupy this post, uh, previously having served as Acting Principal Defender and with the court since 2003. Claire, the floor is yours. I want to start by looking at some of the offenses which the prosecutor actually charged our convicts then accused persons with. And these charges include murder, a crime against humanity, taking of hostages in co connection with the May 2000 abduction of UN peacekeepers, murder as a war crime in relation to the abduction of peacekeepers, rape, extermination, acts of terror, enslavement, looting and burning, sexual slavery, conscription of children into armed conflict. Uh, now, in the 1990s, when uh, we had the name Sierra Leone, the images that come to mind of Sierra Leone in the 1990s is that of brutality, mutilation, abduction, rape, murder of children. You see children carrying weapons that are heavier than themselves, a campaign of terror by armed groups against innocent unarmed civilians, especially women and children. Uh, the systematic amputations herding of frightened and crying groups of people who were murdered en masse, repeated sexual violence, carving of the word, RUF, into bodies of even children with knives and machetes became hallmarks of the Sierra Leonean conflict. As a result of which, the government of Sierra Leone and the United Nations brought together the special court and our mandate has come so far. And now we do have convicts in Rwanda and 
again the Taylor trial in The Hague, which is in the appeal stages. The whole crime scene is the country of Sierra Leone, and everybody in Sierra Leone was affected by the war, either as a primary victim or a secondary victim. Either maybe somebody lost an arm or a leg physically, or their home, or their village, or their livelihood, or loved ones. And of course, evidence brought before the court is so harrowing, but we're here to tell the story and to be able to highlight the success of the special court. As the chief defender of the special court, my task has been to ensure that the defense of all accused persons are properly, effectively, and efficiently conducted so that all accused persons, their families, friends, sympathizers, followers, ex-rebels, etc., would know and appreciate the fact that the, SC, the Special Court for Sierra Leone gave all of them an opportunity to be heard and to bring forward their best defense before the court, part of which today has contributed to a just outcome and peace, as was highlighted in the report of our president, which was given a while ago. This has contributed not only to the outcome of peace in Sierra Leone, but to the world at large. In her summing up, in the, the then presiding judge, Justice Julia Sebitundi, one of our special court judges said, and I quote, and this was in her summing up when a judgment was being, sentencing judgment was being passed. She said, Braima, Kamara, and Kano, these are three convicts who are now serving their respective jail terms in Rwanda. Braima, Kamara, and Kano committed some of the most heinous, brutal, and atrocious crime ever recorded in human history. Innocent men, women and children hacked to death, burnt alive, women gang raped to death, sons forced to rape mothers, brothers forced to rape sisters, women's pregnant stomachs lit open to settle bets on the sex of the fetus, arms chopped off, heads placed on six, etc. The trial chamber cannot recall any other conflict in human warfare where the civilian population was subjected to such horrific acts. The work of the court, in a nutshell, is a shining example of Resolution 1325. And we are proud here to say we have actually achieved some of the action points in the UN Secretary General's 2004 report on women, peace, and security. Some of the recommendations which were set in New York, some of it have actually been met in Freetown, Sierra Leone by the special court. And we're happy to say the court has helped to put pressure on the armed part, the warring parties, has ceased hostilities, brought an end to impunity, brought the perpetrators to war crimes and crimes against humanity successfully conducted those trials, and especially prosecute those who are responsible for sexual exploitation, sexual abuse against the victims of the war. I want to also note at this stage that the special court has left a legacy behind. And, and, and this legacy, which it is going to leave, it's not only about gender-based violence, but it is a life-changing one for not only the average Sierra Leonean woman and her children, but also for the world at large. Because we have now come from a state of war to a state of peace, a state of no accountability to a state of accountability. The challenges do not rest there because Peace has returned to Sierra Leone, but 
the ideals of Resolution 1325 have still to be met because we do have incidents of domestic violence and gender-based violence. Of course, the challenge is, is for all of us, not only for us coming from the court, but for all of you in New York, in all the organizations, and in all the ideals that you have in humanity. I want to close by actually borrowing something Ambassador Rapp said when one of the trial chambers delivered, delivered their judgment in the RUF case in Freetown. He said, and I quote, war crimes, these, these are crimes that shock the conscience of humankind. These sentences represent an international recognition of the horrible suffering inflicted on the people of Sierra Leone. But they also send a signal to similar leaders, wherever they may be. If you brutalize civilians to gain or hold power, you too can face condemnation and punishment. I thank you. Thank you, Claire, for your powerful words. Uh, our next speaker is Binta Mansare, uh, also from Sierra Leone and registrar, a registrar of the court since February 2010. Ms. Mansare has been with the court since 2003 and designed the court's acclaimed grassroots uh, program to keep the people of Sierra Leone and later Liberians informed about the court and the trials. The floor is yours. Good evening. Let me join the uh, prosecutor and the president in expressing our kind sentiments to the organizers of this event. Um, I think we have. Okay. I was telling them the good thing about speaking last is you have nothing to say. <laughs> but I'll just try and, uh, you know, uh, give you a brief background of what this is all about. Um, in addition to what the speakers here have said, Resolution 1325, I believe, was inspired, part of, you know, the inspiration uh, that led to the passing of Resolution 1325 is also the mass atrocities that were committed against the women and girls of Sierra Leone. Remember, it was passed in 2000, and we had an 11-year war that raged in Sierra Leone, where women were targeted for rape, gang rape, sexual violence, sexual slavery, forced marriage, and so on and so forth. So it is no coincidence that the Special Court for Sierra Leone did take into account the experiences of women and girls in Sierra Leone. But during the war, while the men, you know, and some women ex-combatants were fighting atrocious wars, um, terrorizing the civilian population, women were peace warriors. And one of the warriors of uh, the peace in Sierra Leone is actually the SRS designer Bangura. And because of that, because of the peace movement led by women, because women were so adamant and relentless in their fight for peace, they were specifically targeted by the ex-combatants. Targeted especially for amputation. Those who were amputated were told to go to the democratically elected government, uh, Tijan Kaba's government, to replace their hands. But the good thing is, when the story is told as it is today, the women and girls of Sierra Leone can be satisfied that something was done about it. And why can they express such satisfaction? It's because they followed the justice process. And how did they follow the justice process? From the inception of the court, the Special Court for Sierra Leone designed a deliberate you know, program, a robust outreach program to reach out to the tens of thousands of women who would never have the opportunity to tell their stories in court. How did we do this? Design programs to explain how the court works. Look at the list of crimes in the court statutes. When you talk about sexual violence, when you talk about sexual slavery, you're talking about gang raping, you're talking about forced marriage, you're talking about crimes against humanity and war crimes. 
you're talking to a very limited, maybe less than 1% of the population in Sierra Leone. But when you take the list of those crimes to communities mm -hmm. and engage with the communities, inform and educate them, explain to them what these terminologies mean, terminologies designed you know, at the Security Council, then they are able to follow the process. They are able to see that the crimes that are going to be prosecuted by the special court are really what happened to them. And just to put things into perspective, when the court was first created, the opponents of international justice were saying the special court was a white man's court. So it took the outreach section to produce booklets and show images of Sierra Leonean women being raped, images of Sierra Leonean women you know, being killed and harassed, terrorized, that finally we were able to you know, counter the propaganda about the whole international criminal justice mechanism. Uh, we did this through organizing also community town hall meetings where court officials went into communities, into rural areas to explain how justice was administered and then answer questions of the communities, provide clarification, questions that was on the minds of women and girls, questions that bothered them that could have affected their perception of justice. For instance, the limited mandate of the court. Women and girls were asking, why is it only those who bear the greatest responsibility? Why not the perpetrators in our communities, our neighbors, those we see every day? Why weren't they charged by the special court? The outreach section was able to establish a link between those foot soldiers that they see in their communities and those charged by the prosecutor for you know, bearing the greatest responsibility because it's on account of their failure you know, or the, the commission or omission of their leadership that led to the suffering of women. Another question that was on the minds of uh, women again, you know, apart from the uh, 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 greatest responsibility, some were saying, why didn't they get the chance to tell their story? Why was it only, you know, one person's uh, story was heard, but mine wasn't heard? We were able to es establish through the outreach program that women who come before the court, who get the chance to tell their stories, were actually talking on behalf of the tens of thousands of women who had similar experiences. So this kind of helped us to manage the expectations and uh, the result of which the president has spoken about when a survey was conducted. And we were pleased to know that in spite of the limitations of the court, the people of Sierra Leone, including the women and girls, have a positive feeling towards the court and believe that this court actually delivered the justice for which it was established to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are also uh, delighted tonight, and I want to welcome Ms. Zainab Hawa Bengora, who became the special representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict in September this year. And we greatly appreciate your being here as a discussant on the panel and very much look forward to hearing from you from both your personal perspective as well as the, the broader context, uh, certainly of the other resolutions that uh, exist uh, to support women's quest for uh, justice. So thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I join the speakers before me to thank UN Women, UNDP, and the International Peace Institute for organizing this meeting. I'm very happy to be here with you today and to be able to participate in this inaugural event of the International Peace Institute, Peace and Security Event Series. I am pleased that you have chosen to begin your series on with a topic that is so close to my heart in many ways. At the outset, I would like to thank the featured speakers from the Special Courts for Sierra Leone, not only for their engaging and informative presentation, but also for the hard work they and their colleagues at the, at the courts have done. I thank you for the commitment you have made to ensure that the special court has been and continues to be able to fulfill its mandates. As a Sierra Leonean, I am incredibly proud of what my country, 
with the support of the United Nations, has been able to achieve with the Special Court for Sierra Leone. The Special Court stands as tangible confirmation that violence during conflict, including sexual violence, will be prosecuted, and that those who commit atrocities against women, children, and men, and those who order individuals to do so can and will be held accountable. It confirms that rape and other forms of sexual violence will be condemned as a war crime or as a crime against humanity, that there will be no place for anyone to hide, and that every resource of the international community will be used to find and prosecute perpetrators to the fullest extent of the law. <clears throat> As I indicated that this subject is there to my heart on a number of different levels. Firstly, I know what it is like to be threatened by rebels who vow to rape and kill me, to silence me and stop me from working to restore peace and democracy in my country. Secondly, I know what it feels like to look your child in the eye and tell him to run for his life because you may not make it out alive. Thirdly, I know what it means to have your home looted and destroyed during a period of conflict. Fourthly, I know what it feels like to flee your country with nothing but a cloth on your back and the hope that you will make it to safety in a land not your own. And finally, I know what it feels like to not only investigate documents, reports, and work with victims to tell their stories, but to testify before the Special Court of Sierra Leone as an expert witness on a trial dealing with some of the most erroneous crime as you had tonight. We have had from the presentations here tonight about how the Sierra Leone Special Court is not only a guiding light, but a living example of what national ownership, national leadership can achieve. We've heard about the court's groundbreaking jurisprudence on sexual violence crime, its witness protection and support programs designed to ensure survivors will be protected for life and its unique community outreach that specifically addresses women and girls. We have also heard from all the principals from the special courts this evening on how the special courts has provided and continue to provide an excellent example of how the goals and objectives of Security Council resolution 1325 has been and can be put into practice. In 2000, after decades of intense struggles for equality and women's rights, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1325. Resolution 1325 therefore paved the way for women in conflict to be heard. It called on all nations and all parties to a conflict to fully respect the rights of women and girls and to protect them. Resolution 1325 also emphasized the responsibility of all states to put an end to impunity and to prosecute those responsible for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, including crimes relating to sexual violence against women and girls. Over the last 12 years, we have built upon the foundation laid by Resolution 1325 with other resolutions, namely Resolution 1820, 2008, 1888, 2009, and 1916, 2010. These resolutions offer unique strategies and proposals for the fight to prevent and punish conflict-related sexual violence. However, as we all know very well, the real measure for change, improvement, and empowerment is not in the adoption of resolutions, but in their effective implementation. I believe that we have moved beyond words and principles, from the margins to the center place, 
and that we are now firmly on a road that is translating the aims of the Security Council resolutions into reality. It is a long road with many challenges still to face and obstacles to overcome, but I remain convinced that we can succeed. The creation of the Office of the Special Representative to the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict and the team of experts on sexual violence in conflict, both of which were created by Resolution 1888, as well as the work of the United Nations Network, such as the United Nations Action on Sexual Violence in Conflict, provide concrete examples of what we can do to empower women in post-conflict societies and specifically in the justice system being rebuilt in these societies. For example, the team of experts is working with states to strengthen their capacity by assisting with draft legislation criminalizing conflict-related sexual violence or by providing expertise to help states improve their investigative and prosecutorial capabilities. Both types of assistance contribute to holding perpetrators of sexual violence accountable in national courts. The team of experts bring together experts from UNDP, <coughs> DPKO, OHCHR, with the team leader in my office. The team will closely cooperate with the experts from the United Kingdom Initiative as it does with the Justice Rapid Response. Many other UN entities, NGOs, and local, national, and international organizations are also working hard to ensure that respect for the rights of women is woven into every facet of society, including economic, political, and legal participation. UN women's leading role in this regard is critical. Of course, the work of the international criminal justice system, including the work of the special court, has contributed to encouraging the participation of victims of sexual violence in investigations and prosecutions. Prosecutions can only succeed if victims have confidence in the police investigating the crimes, trust in the judicial system in charge of prosecuting accused, and feel they will be prosecuted if they participate in the proceedings. What we must now focus on is assisting national governments to take responsibility for addressing, in a meaningful, just, and effective manner, conflict-related sexual violence. For me, the Special Court for Sierra Leone shows what can be done with strong political will, with the right expertise, with the right tools, and with national ownership. Long-term solutions to the problem of conflict-related violence cannot be imposed from outside. It is therefore imperative that we continue to build on what we have developed and work towards ensuring that at all levels of a society, there will be no impunity for rape and other forms of sexual violence. It is with participation at all levels, local, national, and international, that we can make the end of sexual violence in conflict a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, tonight we, um, we have such a large audience. Normally I would like to ask a question, start the questions myself. And uh, I actually have a list of questions that I would uh, like to ask this great uh, panel, but I'm going to open up the, to the floor right away. Um, but if I can just make a few comments. We are ta taping the discussion. So if you would wait for the microphone and introduce yourself and the organization and your organization with the question. Uh, also, I just want to mention that given that the Charles Taylor case is under appeal, we ask for your understanding regarding the limitations on what the principals can say about the case. So with that, the floor is uh, open and um, I'll, we'll take your questions. And if we don't have any questions, then I'll, I'll start on my list. OK, well, I'll give you all a, a couple of minutes to uh, start thinking. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to maybe if I can start with you, uh, um, Justice Fisher, and just give an a, a, a example of what you 
you know, as a, as a legal professional, really consider a, a groundbreaking area for what the court has accomplished in the area of uh, jurisprudence, you know, that is focused uh, in the area of uh, violence against women. Well, I think <clears throat> the three uh, big accomplishments in the jurisprudence having to do specifically with gender justice. Uh, the first is recognizing forced marriage as a crime against humanity. Uh, ours was the first court to do so. The second, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, in identifying and laying a foundation for the jurisprudence on the use and recruitment of child soldiers. Uh, that is a neutral term, and obviously child soldiers usually brings to mind boys, but thousands of girls were also abducted uh, and brought into combat situations as child soldiers as well, and they have unique needs and suffered in a unique way, separate and different from uh, the boys that, that also had uh, horrendous uh, experiences in that regard. And thirdly, recognizing sexual violence as a form of terrorism, uh, that it was not only violence directed against the individual, but it was violence directed against women, particularly in order to terrorize the entire community and to get a secondary benefit besides just committing the underlying crime, but also getting the benefit of uh, frightening the community and areas uh, connected to the community. So those, those are recognized, I think, as the three major areas in which uh, gender justice uh, th has been uh, promoted and formed the basis of jurisprudence that didn't, wasn't previously recognized. And I would just add that to show the, the interrelationship of those uh, accomplishments in our jurisprudence in child soldiers was the foundation and acknowledged as such for the ICC's first trial decision in Lubanga. So our foundation has contributed now to the ICC jurisprudence and it will be taken from there, I suspect, by other tribunals as well. My next question, and I'm not quite sure who to address this to, but it came to mind, uh, particularly with uh, listening to some of your comments, uh, Special Representative Bangora, is around the issue of training, what the, the special court has done. In particular, I know that it was uh, a part of your mandate that the staff be given uh, gender sens sensitivity training. So if one of you could adjust that question, uh, maybe it's for you, Binta, as the, the best person to take it. The question, the question is about what the special court has done around the issue of training uh, in your work, particularly uh, around the issue of gender sensitivity. Oh. Well, internally, uh, trainings are conducted all the time because uh, the Office of the Prosecutor itself, the Witness Management Unit, um, first of all, they make it easier by ensuring that uh, it's people with the right relevant experience who work in those sections, especially the witness protection section, because that is where, you know, the, the, the vulnerabilities. You are dealing with women who are not exposed to these kinds of courts, uh, who are fearful of uh, going to the courtroom and giving their testimony. So you have to make sure that you address the physical, emotional, and psychological aspects of testifying. And that has to be done before the courtroom. So um, we have a very well experienced uh, chief of witness, uh, chief of victims and witness protection unit, and he conducts the training. At times, he asks for help. Uh, for instance, we had we had a team of um, trainers from Scotland Yard in uh, from the UK to train our witness protection officers. So we've we, we've done that. But in addition to that, even the national you know, police who are seconded to the national witness, uh, to the um, court's witness protection program, they have also been trained to make sure that they understand 
the vulnerabilities of these women, the trauma, you know, addressing the psychosocial aspects of uh, the testimony. Yes, so we have done quite a bit in terms of a training, even when we go out you know, for outreach. The strategy you use when you talk to, uh, you, the strategy you adopt for gender outreach is different from the strategy you adopt if you're dealing with other target groups. Uh, for instance, when we don't encourage people to stand up and tell their you know, stories during outreach events, but if they feel very strongly that they should, you know, as part of the uh, you know, trauma uh, relief process, we do allow them to do that. And um, we go to settings where we know that if women should surprise us to just stand up and speak, at least it is the right environment. And again, trainings are conducted in that regard. Thank you. Okay, so I'll open it up to the audience. And we do have a question. Um, very good. We'll, we'll go over here in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Janne Antila from the Mission of Finland to the UN. Thank you very much for organizing the event and for our excellent panelists. It's truly an inspiring panel for us to look at. I work on issues of women, peace and security at our mission. And I have to apologize for my ignorance if I don't know it from before, whether the court had a mandate to also consider reparations. None of you mentioned it in your, in your presentation, so I would be interested in hearing about that aspect. And also, when listening about the outrage program, I was wondering about the relationship of the court with the Truth Commission and whether that provided another forum for people to tell their stories and how, how did that work? Thank you so much. Okay. The first aspect of your question, uh, the court statute does not provide for reparations as we know it. Uh, it's different from the ICC statute. Ours is the justice. You deliver it, although you can argue that reparations was part of it, perhaps that is a limitation of the statute. But we do work with the national institutions and civil society who are advocating for reparations, uh, especially the, tr the trust fund aspect of it. Um, you know, for the, that was supposed to be organized by the government of Sierra Leone. So what we did through the outreach program, we, we supported civil society, set up forum. They used our outreach forum to actually raise awareness about this whole uh, reparations issues. Um, again, if uh, the other aspect could be maybe financial compensation, it's not in the statute, but the act. If civil society, you know, wants to claim any compensation from the court, those, the victims, they could go to the national courts, but that is contingent upon seizure of any property. But so far, no property has been seized uh, by the special court because all the accused persons declared themselves indigent. Mr. Taylor declared himself, he was declared partially indigent. So that's the situation as far as reparations is concerned. And the second question was the... The relationship with the Truth Commission. Oh, the relationship with the Truth Commission. Um, that's an interesting one. I would... The, the relationship was tense at one point in time, but that's because when the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Commission was established, it was given all the powers you can imagine, powers to you know, listen to anyone. At that time, the special court was not taken into account. The powers of an international criminal justice mechanism wasn't taken into account. So where the tension you know, came from, the Truth Commission wanted to take statements from accused persons under the custody of the special court. Then how that was to be done was where the disagreement was. The courts agreed for statements to be given, but in writing. The Truth Commission said no. They, for them, it was a public hearing, so they wanted to record all those statements. And of course, the court, you know, there were two, the stakes were too high for the special court. 
Uh, so that didn't happen. So because of that, you know, there was tension between the two institutions. And some people b argued that it was not a good idea to have the Truth Commission and the Special Court exist at the same time because of that. But I would argue that it wasn't wrong to have the Truth Commission and the Special Court establish and operate around the same time. What the lesson to be learned from that was when we pass acts, you know, in Parliament, we need to look at the laws and the, 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 the powers of these institutions and see and anticipate where attention could be and see which institution had supremacy over the other. Because the Truth Commission was acting rightly, but the Special Court was also acting rightly in accordance with their you know, the jurisdiction. So that was the problem with the Truth Commission and the Special Court existing together. Yes. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. On the issue of national uh, reparation, I, I think the important issue and the unique thing about the Special Court is an agreement between the United Nations and the government of Sierra Leone. So what the government of Sierra Leone did was to set, to create through the national legislation an, a commission that is dealing with reparation. And a trust fund was created, and now they've started dealing with that issue. And of course, they, ha they are very gender sensitive. So there is a national commission, it's called NAXA, and they have a trust fund that they have developed, and NAXA actually is legislated by the parliament of Sierra Leone. And so they are dealing with the reparation. So like uh, and the registrar said, the special court is dealing with the justice issue. The other issue that they are not dealing with is taken by the government, because the special court is an agreement between the government of Sierra Leone and it's working together. So whatever the limitation are with the court, the government takes up that responsibility. This is the reason why we're talking about national ownership and national leadership. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yes. <coughs> I um, want to add and on the issue of the TRC and the special court. At the end of the day, uh, both institutions help to bring peace to Sierra Leone. And the special court had a limited mandate to try those most responsible. As such, they could not try all the perpetrators. That is where the TRC really came in to complement the work of the court, especially in hearing stories from victims and having perpetrators come before it. And if you look at the composition of uh, this commission, this truth commission, they do have religious, tribal, traditional community leaders and people from uh, uh, the communities and the country as a whole. So at the end of the day, some of the answers which may be as a court, because we're there to bring an end to impunity. We have punitive measures and sanctions. The TRC is go home and see no more, trying to mend body, soul, and spirit in the community for them to go and live again. So uh, at the end of the day, it has been a win-win situation for Sierra Leone. Thank you. And I just wanted to add uh, one more point to the reparation issue. Uh, although the court's mandate does not permit reparation judgments, uh, what it does allow in the statute is for the liability that is established for the commission of the crimes to be taken to a, either a, the trust fund or some other adjudicatory body locally to determine what the uh, compensation should be so that the victim or witness or uh, uh, litigant does not have to reprove the crime that the crime was committed. So you can take that judgment, and so half of what would have to be proven in a normal civil case has already been established by the judgment of the court on the criminal case because the standard is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So <clears throat> it does facilitate, but does not provide for reparations. So I think we had a question up here in the front. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Brenda Akia, and I'm from Uganda, but I'm currently working with Human Rights Watch here in New York. I'm very 
I'm, as, I'm very glad to have attended this because it has really opened my eyes regarding what sexual violence, and I'm really very passionate about that. So my question is directed to uh, maybe the, okay, basically all of you, um, the issue of selectivity regarding prosecution of sexual violence really traumatizes me because, as you mentioned, uh, international, supranational courts are really focused on the, those who are mostly responsible for the leaders. And then we tend to see that most of the African countries that have, that have experienced sexual violence in conflict have structures courts that do not are not able to prosecute they may but sometimes they have weak they are weak when they come to prosecute this they don't have victim witness protection and we find that a lot of impunity is promoted in these countries so how are you going to deal with that and how what do you think is going to is the way forward for us to be able to deal with um, this issue of selectivity so that we deal with the foot soldiers as well. And Because I believe sexual violence is uh, the gravest crime that could ever be committed under international criminal law, and no one should be left unpunished. So how are you going to go about this? And um, maybe you could also share the experience from, from, the, from the special court on how it has gone about with this. Thank you very much. Um, that is why I did mention to you on the issue of the team of experts. What we are trying to do is actually going into countries and looking at their capability. Sometimes they don't even have legislation that actually criminalizes sexual violence, and we work with them to draft the legislations. There are cases where we train police people to be able to investigate sexual violence. There are cases where we train magistrates to be able to actually make sure that it prosecutes the issue of sexual violence. We're working with countries in where even the constitutions, we're trying to help them to help draft. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it is either in Colombia in which we're looking at the, the, the witness protection program, and we're trying to see how we could take them to pair them up to take them to Sierra Leone to do a study of the excellent work that the Special Court of Sierra Leone has done in the witness protection. So that is our job. That's why we have the team of experts, and that's why we're exceptionally happy that the UN, the United Nations gov UK government is also working with us, because for the expert that we do not have, their experts will also join our experts to go into countries and identify where are the problems. Because at the end of the day, the issue of sexual violence is not a UN issue only. This is why we're saying there has to be national ownership. Because it is the primary and moral responsibility of a country to, prove, to protect its citizens, especially the most vulnerable. So if we find out that you do not have the capability to do it, our job is to work with you to see what are the systems and structures you build within the country to be able to do that. And we're going as far as also starting to work, want to work with regional and sub-regional organization so that the issue of sexual violence is actually put into their peace and security architecture, like the ECOWAS, like the AU, so that they're building in and we have a memorandum of understanding and we allow national governments. So that's what we are doing in our own um, 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 units. And that's why we have the team of experts, because these are people on the rule of law, on human rights, on gender. And in forensic science, you have the British who are working, this is why we are, we are now working with them, and you must have heard recently they just gave us an, uh, one million pounds, and the US government is supporting the, the Germans and various other people. So that's what we are, that's what we do. So once the prosecution finishes, it is for sustainability to ensure we put an end to impunity, to try the foot soldiers so that you can be able to charge them locally and deal with them. Thank you. We, thank you. Give uh, enough opportunity to people. So I saw two questions here in the middle, and so I'd like to take these two questions in the middle uh, right here. Sorry. So we'll take two questions. 
and then we'll turn look for. Thank you, I'm Margareta Grappe, and I am representing the World Council of Churches. And I also want to join the choir of admiration and gratitude for, for what you have said. I have a question that goes a little bit beyond uh, the context in which you are working. And I'm particularly interested to know, particularly from the discussions from Sierra Leone, if you feel that the norms stating that violence against women and children, uh, women and girls, and children of course also, it's not okay, regardless of the conflict context and not. Do you feel that it will have a larger consequence also in civil times, that the general population and the general audience will understand that it is really a crime to be involved in violence against women? Thank you. Uh, Maria O'Reilly, IPI, thank you all so much for being here and for your excellent work. My, fr I actually had two questions, and my first was extremely similar. What effect do you feel that your work has had on societal attitudes more broadly in Sierra Leone? And what do you think the connection between uh, the justice approach and uh, really a change in attitude is? And my second question, if you'd be so kind as to share some more of the challenges that you faced, what proved difficult? What are the lessons that might really be valuable in other cases? Thank you. Um, first of all, when um, we're talking about the success of the courts as far as Sierra Leone and Sierra Leoneans are concerned, I want to say in addition to the hallmarks of uh, the, our stamp marks that we've left on um, issues pertaining to gender, domestic violence, women and children, sexual exploitation. In addition to that, we do have a whole load of accolades from which Sierra Leoneans are benefiting. And of course, that ranges, first of all, from the staff of the special court, the passing down of uh, human resource training firsthand from internationals to locals, and it also even extends to the Sierra Leone Bar Association. In fact, um, present here, our deputy ambassador was also at one time one of the attorneys of the special court. We have had the opportunity of having mixed teams of internationals and Sierra Leoneans working either as lead counsel, co-counsel, legal assistants, investigators, or even court officials in various capacities. So uh, the question of the benefits are unending. And we have had the opportunity of having our detention in Freetown for a very long time. And over the period, we've had to have trained Sierra Leone prison officers who actually have, have now, most of them have gone back to the national system. And also the police were helping to train them. And in addition, as the registrar has said, we do go all around the country and we do hold outreach meetings, and especially even with the Sierra Leone military, and we talk about human rights law, humanitarian law, international criminal law, and the rule of law in general. And when the court started, there was virtually no national legal aid scheme in Sierra Leone. Legal aid was almost unheard of, except for murder, uh, treason, offenses which carry the death penalty. But as we speak now today, there is a national legal aid pilot project. And the registrar's baby, one of the babies she wants to leave behind, is the National Witness Protection Program. And um, she's working, her, sec her, her section, witness and victim section, is in close collaboration with the Sierra Leone police. And it is going to be highly beneficial especially for women and children in Sierra Leone. Because right now, the Sierra Leone police does have a family support unit. And now we have legislations in place which were not there before the war. 
and before the courts. For instance, the, uh, the SRS, G was and I were just talking about the Gender Acts, the Domestic Violence Act. We're even talking of the uh, Child Acts, the Anti-Human Trafficking, the Sexual Offenders Act. And so now we have the legislations in place, and we only need to have the institutions strengthened. So as we phase out, we're hoping, of course, to leave a museum behind, which will actually have house what work and the challenges that the court has faced. We do have challenges, and that lies in our funding situation, as has been said, because we're leaving behind the residual special court. We have the archives, and presently in Freetown also, our registrar has brought under the same roof our TRC records. So we're trying to see how much we can be able to preserve all these very important documents so that scholars, um, jurists, researchers, and um, posterity will have an opportunity to see not only the work people like you and us are doing in Sierra Leone, but at least for the future to establish a never again culture for the people of Sierra Leone. OK, so we're running out of time, but I did see two last questions that I would like to give the folks. I think we had the gentleman in the front row and the woman over here. And uh, these will be our last questions of the evening. Thank you very much. Um, Ugoja Dama is a, um, the African Affairs Committee of the New Bar Association. This question is for my learned colleague, uh, Ms. Binta Manseri. It's regards uh, female child soldiers. Um, we're all well aware that um, DDR did not succeed in Sierra Leone as regards the female child soldiers. Could you give me um, your intake on that? And secondly, um, as regards child soldiers generally, how do you, this is just an open question for everybody, how do you regard them? Do you regard them as perpetrators? Do you regard them as innocent parties or just innocent bystanders? How do you regard um, the child soldiers generally? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Kai Baldo. I'm from the German Mission to the United Nations. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience uh, with us tonight. Um, of all the achievements you have accomplished, not only for Sierra Leone, but also, I think, for many other places in the world. And if we look at it from a best or a good practice point of view, I would, was very impressed by the statistics you were presenting, that actually people in Sierra Leone were saying that um, you contributed um, to peace through justice. And when we talk about post-conflict situations in many different regions of the world, in many cases, justice is presented to us as contradictory to reconciliation and peace. So my question would be, what would be the message to be brought out to many other country situations we are dealing with in the United Nations to tell people that justice is a necessary prerequisite actually for creating peace and reconciliation. Thank you. If I may answer that question, the, the answer is outreach. Beginning, middle, and end outreach. If uh, Binta had not taken the court to the people of Sierra Leone, we would never have gotten that kind of a result. It's getting people to understand how justice works and feeling that they're being heard and asking them what they want from the process and actually incorporating that that makes the difference in terms of reconciliation. It's not what happens in the courtroom. Sometimes we refight the war in the courtroom. It's what happens in the community, and that is all about communicating and bringing the court to the people. And that's, that's the biggest lesson that can be learned from, from this court. And that can be done only by people who know their communities in a complementary court situation. And that, that's, if, you're, if you leave with nothing else, that's, that's the lesson. So, Bitta, do you want to address the child soldier question and then anybody else who wants to add on that? Oh. Um, I, I just wanted to, to, to add to what the, the, the president of the court said. In Sierra Leone, we had a very peculiar case because we had to arrest the police, the national police, 
had to arrest the Deputy Minister of Defense, who is in charge of the police force. In his office, he went to work. He was there, sitting there as a minister. His own police had to walk into his office, salute him, and said, you're under arrest. It wasn't the special cause which arrested him. Everybody thought, because he was a very popular man, and everybody thought, if you arrest him, there's, there are going to be riots. But because the, the country had been prepared, they had been educated on the, the level of atrocity. And when you do that, you, you must account. There has to be accountability. And the courts had said, those who bear the greatest responsibility. So it means we're going after the leadership who had the command and control of the troops. Because these are the people who actually gave the instructions for atrocities to be committed. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good example. I mean, this is not like where you get the UN troops to go and blockade the streets and block it. No. The police went there. His own police went there into his office, knocked at his door. He was there in the morning to walk, saluted him, and said, you're under arrest. And they took him, arrested him, and took it to the courts. Where has that ever been done in this world? That's just what it tells you. So it tells you that because before the court started sitting, a lot of background work was done. Before even the first hearing was done, they went across the country, which prepared the people. So when the, 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 the prosecution, when the, 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 they started, people just said, this is what needs to be done. And that is what will bring peace. I think that's very important. So obviously, again, he said it tells you what's education, civic education, participation of the people involved in it. Even when there are trials, sometimes we have open street televisions. So people actually watch. They put screens in the streets, in places where people cannot afford television. They actually put it. They, it's broadcast live on the national radio. The trials are immediately live on the national radio. So wherever you are, in the most remote village, you can actually hear the, pro the process, sometimes two, three hours. The government agrees to give that facility to the special court. So people are engaged. They're part and parcel of the process. So, Binta, do you want to comment on the question on child soldiers, and then we'll wrap it up? Yes. OK. Well, um, yes, you're right. Uh, DDR was successful uh, to a very large extent, but it was a failure as far as the incorporating gender perspective is concerned. I did a study on that, so I know very well what you're talking about. Um, girl soldiers, not only girl soldiers, but even women soldiers, those who didn't go through the formal structure of demobilization were just left out. And that's uh, one issue the country had to uh, grapple with. In terms of your second question, how do you regard child soldiers? That's a debate for all of us. We can't have a simple answer to that. So I think that's a discussion that can continue and reflection that can continue. Whether they are perpetrators, or, or victims, it depends on who you're talking to. In Sierra Leone, children were war machines. They were killing machines. If you were talking to a woman who was raped by a child soldier, a woman whose children you know, were killed by a child soldier, that woman would tell you that they are perpetrators. <coughs> if you're talking to child rights activists, they would define it in a different light. That's why I'm saying your question is a question. I think it's a very nice way of closing this discussion because it gives us food for thought and reflection. Thank you. And that certainly is a very challenging end for all of us, but I can't thank you all for coming tonight for your, your, your commitment to this work and for what you bring to it and the ongoing, the follow through as well. So thank you all and thank you all for participating.